Hello and welcome to this session of ACS Science Talks, Connecting the Word Through Science. This is the virtual lecture series, Scientific Talks by Specialists on Specialized Topics for a Specialized Audience. I'm Aparna Sharma and I'm pleased to be your host for today's broadcast of ACS Science Talks. I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Mihir Jha and Dr. Kaushik Natrajan, who will be moderating today's lecture. Some announcements. This session will be recorded live and would be placed in the ACS Science Talks library. In case you face any technical difficulty, you can reach out to us in the chat box. ACS Science Talks are an interactive program and we would love to get you involved in the discussion. You can share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A panel. The moderator will take up these questions with expert during the Q&A session. You can use the chat app to introduce yourself and you can say hi to our expert. Before we begin the session, a brief message from the American Chemical Society. Our efforts at ACS are guided by our vision and mission, which also determine our goals. To provide information solutions that address global challenges and other issues facing the world scientific community, to empower our members by providing access to opportunities, resources, skills training, and network. To support excellence in education by fostering the development of innovative, relevant, and effective chemistry and chemistry-related education. To communicate chemistry's value to the public and to the policymakers. To embrace and advance inclusion in chemistry by promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and respect, and creating a welcome and supporting an environment. In its efforts, ACS provides a variety of resources. One of the flagship ACS resource is the ACS Meetings. Just like ACS Science Talk is a platform by ACS to connect researchers, ACS Meetings aims at unifying the scientific community. Every year, active researchers and professionals from across the globe came together to share ideas and advance the scientific and technical knowledge. ACS meetings are regularly attended by thousands of science professionals every year. As we mentioned about the goals and vision of ACS to support the global scientific enter enterprise, ACS has taken the challenge of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and converted it into an opportunity. ACS meetings have embraced the hybrid model, which is helping us to enhance the networking opportunity by combining in-person interactions with the virtual networking platforms, by promoting inclusion and accessibility through removing geographical barriers, enhance representation by reaching out to diverse range of presenters and attendees providing flexibility and convenience by accommodating different preferences and circumstances, increasing engagement and interaction to foster a dynamic and inclusive conference environment, provide continued knowledge sharing opportunities by ensuring continuity of knowledge sharing during unforeseen circumstances, promote sustainability and cost effectiveness, by eliminating the need for travel and accommodation expenses and associated carbon footprint. To further the hybrid model and increase its effectiveness for our global audience, we are glad to introduce the Global Virtual Symposia. The Virtual Symposia will offer a virtual, fully virtual programming covering various dedicated tracks in chemistry and the light fields. These symposia are being developed in collaboration with the global ACS constituents, providing sessions in the daytime of different global regions like Asia, Pacific, Africa, Middle East, Australia, and Latin America. In the upcoming ACS Fall meeting in August 2024, the Global Virtual Symposium will feature five symposium. The call for abstracts remain open till April 5th, April 1st. So our speaker for today is Professor Amritya Mukhopadhyay. Professor Mukhopadhyay is currently a professor at the Department of Metallurgical Engineering and Materials Science, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Professor Mukhopadhyay completed his doctoral in materials research from the University of Oxford, UK in 2009. 
He did his postdoctoral research at Brown University, USA for a couple of years. He's a young associate of the Indian National Science Academy of Engineering and served as the honorary secretary of Mumbai chapter of the Indian Institute of Metals. His research interest includes materials, electrochemistry, and cell fabrication for electrochemical energy storage, focusing on metal ion and metal-based batteries. Among his major accomplishment, he has been awarded with the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship 2020-21 recognized by the Royal Society of Chemistry UK journals as one of the 2019 emerging investigators awarded with the IIT Bombay Research Discrimination Award 2018, INA Young Engineering Award 2016, ASM IAM North America Visiting Leadership 2016, IIT Bombay Young Investigator Award 2014, and Dr. R. L. Thakur Memorial Award by the Indian Ceramic Society in 2013. Thank you very much, Professor Mukhopadhyay, for joining us, and the stage is all yours. Thanks, Aparna, for the nice introduction, uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be one of the speakers in the ACS Science Talk series. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to get the invite, and I will try to share uh, something about the cathode materials for sodium ion batteries today. Let me begin by saying that today I'm not going to showcase any cathode material or any electrode per se, which can be taken up for a commercial application, say, tomorrow. Uh, such electrode materials or such or uh, any such materials which are uh, which are suitable for a, a practical application, but that takes time. And, and that needs a lot of understanding and optimizations based on such understanding. And personally, I believe that developing such understanding and trying to address the issues uh, uh, that, are, that are presently being faced by the technology based on these understanding is one of the very important job for a researcher in an academia. So today I will try to discuss some of the concepts uh, based on which not just me, but any of you would be able to develop the cathode materials for sodium ion battery in more specific terms, layer transition metal oxide based cathode materials for sodium ion batteries, which can elevate sodium ion batteries or the performance of the sodium ion batteries to, a, to, the, next, to the level of the next generation. And, and as needed for the high, for the large scale applications, including, including possibly electric vehicle in some, sometime in the near future. So with this brief introduction about what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, let me first uh, show the research activities that are currently going on in India. Uh, and, and let me tell you that this slide is probably two to three years old, so it is no way comprehensive and there are much more research going on in, across the country than what is shown in this slide. So this is more like, a, uh, like some of the places where different research activities related to alkali metal ion batteries are taking place. And it is good to see that such work is going on all over the country uh, from the north to south to the east to the west. Uh, so Bombay is, uh, is or Mumbai is somewhere here and IIT Bombay is one of the institutes in Mumbai. It's the Indian Institute of Technology Bombay. And in IIT Bombay, we have at least 12 groups working on various aspects related to battery. And in my group, per se, uh, a lot of uh, recent focus is on the sodium ion battery chemistry, which is the topic of today, as well as solid state uh, cell chemistry, in addition to continuing to work on lithium ion chemistry and even beyond sodium ion chemistry. Now, let me uh, in, uh, give you a glimpse of the various research groups that are working on batteries and related stuff. So as I told, there are at least 12 groups and again, there may be more groups which are being missed out on this slide. So we work on a lot of aspects related to the next generation or the advanced batteries, right from the concept stage towards to the prototyping, uh, to even battery recycling and so on and so forth, uh, involving various chemistries, not just alkali metal ion battery chemistries, but also redox flow chemistries, metal air chemistries, or various possible chemistries. And in addition to the cell where there are research groups who also work on the power electronic aspects to take it to a uh, to the prototype stage with respect to the battery pack, not just a cell. 
So with uh, so with this introduction about the battery research at IIT Bombay, let me give you a glimpse of what we do in the group in our in my group, uh, which is in the which is located in the Department of Metallurgical Engineering and Material Science. Uh, we, I call the group as Advanced Batteries and Ceramics Groups uh, group, and and so we focus on various aspects related to the alkali metal ion batteries. Uh, right from the concept stage to the cell prototype. So when I say prototype here, I mean a cell level prototype. And the chemistry is into lithium ion, sodium ion, and now also potassium ion, solid state uh, systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of the key contributions from our group has been on the layer transition metal oxide based cathode materials. Uh, how to render them air water stable, which is very important, not from the not just from the scientific perspective, but also from a from the from a practical perspective, because uh, the battery community is looking to move forward towards aqueous process electrodes and do away with the usage of NMP uh, to process the electrodes. So the development of air and water stable cathode materials are very important. We have also had some contributions on the nickel containing layer transition metal oxide cathodes for the lithium ion batteries and, and also some uh, uh, good contributions on the solid state uh, lithium based cells, especially the interface between the solid electrolyte and the anode and the electrode, as well as how to make the uh, how to make the solid electrolyte as air water stable so that one can one does not need a, a drop environment to handle the solid electrolyte which is what the next generation battery systems are looking at and how to prevent or suppress the dendrite penetration to a significant extent so with all these uh, kind of appetizer before the main course let me now move on to the topic of today and uh, so today's topic is on sodium ion batteries is related to sodium ion batteries so so let me tell you what are the good things and the bad things about sodium ion battery. Well, in, in one of the recent conferences, one of my friends called lithium ion battery as the king of electrochemical energy storage. And indeed, lithium ion battery is presently the king of electrochemical energy storage. Nobody can doubt that. Uh, but let me um, now put forward that sodium ion battery is probably the crown prince. And it is the crown prince because for from the sustainability point of view we have to move beyond the lithium ion battery system and also have the energy storage at a relatively lesser price and use precursors which are which are widespread and not located at only a few countries or used resources which are widespread available everywhere and not located in a few countries so that's why sodium ion batteries are very important for many countries, not just India, yes, it is very important for India, but it is also equally important for many other countries. Uh, and another good thing about sodium ion battery chemistry is that we can use a lot of knowledge base generated from the lithium ion battery chemistry and the lithium ion battery technology and use those knowledge base to develop the sodium ion battery technology as well, including the sodium ion battery chemistry. Now, so the industry does not need to make a huge shift for, for moving from the lithium ion battery technology to the sodium ion battery technology, unlike for many other battery chemistries. Now, uh, comparing lithium ion battery chemistry and sodium ion battery chemistry, one very important aspect is the sodium ion battery cathode materials. Now, here I'm talking about the layered transition metal oxide based cathode materials. So, they do not need the usage of cobalt at all. So lithium ion battery cathode materials, we know it all started with lithium cobalt oxide coming from Professor Budenov's lab, uh, uh, which had like 100% cobalt as the transition metal ion. Uh, so with, with progress over the years, uh, we have now been able to reduce the cobalt content in the layer transition metal oxide, have the lithium NMCs with part of the cobalt being replaced with nickel and manganese, which are very good because the cobalt content has gone down, but there are issues. Uh, related to the disordering or cation disordering of this layered structure uh, in the presence of nickel and manganese. So, but anyway, so the cobalt content is going down, but it is for practical application, it still needs some cobalt to have a nice layered or cation ordered rock salt structure. So, but the sodium transition metal oxide can form a nice layered structure without the need of cobalt in the transition metal slab. And that is primarily to do with a big difference in the 
uh, radius of the sodium ion and the transition metal ion, unlike that of the lithium ion and the transition metal ion. So cobalt is not needed in a nutshell. Now, from the current collector's perspective, copper is not needed uh, on the on the anode side of the sodium ion battery system because uh, sodium does not alloy with aluminium. So aluminium can be used on both the sides, the cathode side as well as the anode side. But for the lithium ion chemistry, copper is needed on the anode side because aluminium cannot be used and that is because aluminium can alloy with lithium and you don't want the current collector to get lithiated or don't want the current collector to react and you want it to be inert. So one has to use copper for the lithium ion battery anode side, but for the sodium ion battery anode side, one can simply use aluminium. So aluminium current collector on both the sides saves the, or helps in reducing the cost further. Another big advantage which not many people talk about is that one can store sodium ion battery at zero state of charge, whereas that is not possible for the lithium ion battery system. If one recollects when we buy a lithium ion cell from the market or we buy, say, a laptop or a cell phone, we all, the, the, the cell is always at about a 50% state of charge. It's not stored at zero state of charge. But if we have the device, the sodium ion cell, we may be having the cell stored at zero state of charge, and that will be a big advantage. Having said that, Sodium ion battery is still a crown prince and not the king, and there is a reason for that. So there are issues. And because there are issues, researchers like us in the academia, they get interested and they have some job to do. So one of the issue is that uh, graphitic carbon, which has been the workhorse anode material for the lithium ion battery system, does not work for sodium ion battery system because uh, graphitic carbon cannot host sodium ions uh, via the intercalation mechanism, uh, unlike it, unlike it can host lithium ion by the intercalation mechanism. So one has to look beyond graphitic carbon as the anode material. Coming to the cathode material side, again, I'm talking about the layered transition metal oxides because the, that, is the, uh, that is the class of cathode material which can give me the highest capacity and possibly the highest energy density. So, but the layered transition metal oxides uh, for sodium ion batteries, that is the sodium layered transition metal oxide, which is the topic of today. They are highly hygroscopic. They are uh, usually they are highly unstable in uh, when, when exposed to air and and not at all stable if one di dips it in water. For, let's forget about stirring in water. So then this highly hygroscopic nature is uh, is is a big disadvantage for usage of the layered uh, transition metal oxide based cathode materials for the sodium ion batteries, and and so because the handling storage becomes an issue and one may not one. So what one would think is that it may not be possible to use water to prepare a cathode slurry if one is using a layered trans transition metal oxide based cathode material for sodium ion battery. So that is one. The second is that compared to the lithium transition metal oxides like the lithium NMCs, the layered sodium transition metal oxide are also unstable upon desodiation, upon electrochemical desodiation and sodiation that is during the charge and the discharge. And, and so it, the structural, the stability of the structure suffers and so the electrochemical cyclic stability. So these are the challenges. But again, uh, because these are the challenges, we have some work to do and we try our best to understand the basic causes of these challenges and figure out a way from the scientific perspective how to address the challenges and then take it forward. Now, again, uh, regarding the sodium ion battery chemistry or the sodium ion battery technology, we believe that uh, the sodium once the sodium ion battery development uh, is as widespread as the lithium ion battery development, the cost per energy density uh, can can go down by about thirty to forty percent, and the absence of cobalt, usage of aluminium in place of copper as current collector, and many other aspects will drive the reduction in the cost. Now, so we, we, so we know about some of the commercial level sodium ion battery prototypes, if not already sold in the market, which have come to the news. And, and so, uh, so they have been coming out in various countries, including in India, where KPIT recently launched a commercial uh, sodium, ion battery, sodium ion battery prototype, which has an impressive energy density. Other than that, there have been other a few others other commercial prototypes which have come to the news. And as one can see here, even though layered sodium transition metal oxides uh, would have been the first choice for uh, for being the cathode material because they possess the high 
highest possible or they can have the highest possible sodium storage capacity but we can see among the commercial prototypes not all to have the layer transition metal oxides probably only these two have right now uh, and and others are, the others have prussian blue or sodium vanadium phosphate uh, which are the other uh, class of cathode material the reason is the challenge associated with the layer transition metal oxide but if we can address these challenges then layered, layered sodium transition metal oxide cathode materials can be used in the sodium ion cells, in the commercial level sodium ion cells, and that can elevate the energy density of the sodium ion batteries to a significant extent. So that that so that should that that is one of the major objectives of sodium ion research worldwide. Now coming to the types of layered transition metal oxide, the structure types and the uh, challenges associated with the different structure type. So, in a nutshell, I can say that so because of the size of the sodium ions, uh, sodium ion uh, as compared to the lithium ions, sodium ions can take up two types of coordination, unlike the lithium ion. So, lithium ion, when 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 surrounded by oxygen ions, can take up an octahedral coordination. It can also take up a tetrahedral coordination. But most, more predominantly for the layered lithium transition metal oxide, the lithium ion uh, stays in an octahedral coordination. Whereas sodium ion, which is uh, a little bit bigger than the lithium ion, can take up an octahedral coordination and can also take up a larger prismatic coordination. So, but it cannot take up a tetrahedral coordination. Now, the, the, the possibility of sodium ion to take up a prismatic coordination with the surrounded by the oxygen ions leads to two, predo two predominant structure types for the layered sodium transition metal oxide. One in which the sodium ion has an octahedral coordination with the oxygen ion and which leads to a O3 type of structure. Now O3 type of structure is exactly the same structure as lithium cobalt oxide or the lithium NMCs. It is exactly the same structure which is a cation ordered rock salt structure. Now, the terminology O and 3 comes from the fact that O indicates octahedral coordination of sodium ion and 3 indicates the number of stacking um, slabs before it starts repeating itself. Uh, so, now, so the O3 type of structure, which is basically the lithium cobalt oxide or lithium NMC structure, uh, has sodium in the octahedral coordination. Now, for sodium ions to move from move in the in the in the sodium layer, which is also known as the interslab phase. So, from in the battery community, the transition the TMO2 uh, uh, space is known as a slab uh, in the battery community, and the, the sodium layer is is refer often referred to as the interslab space. So, for the sodium ions to move in the interslab space, uh, it, uh, sodium ions have to move from an octahedral site to an adjoining tetrahedral site and again to an octahedral site. So, it is this, so it, that is the typical pathway for a movement. Now, sodium ions being bigger in size and since it has to go via a tetrahedral site, the trans sodium transport is quite sluggish in an O3 type of structure. So, that's a disadvantage. Having said that, the O3 type of structure uh, can form with a sodium content of one per formula unit, just like lithium cobalt oxide or lithium NMC, where lithium is one per formula unit. In an O3 type of structure, sodium content can be one per formula unit. Why I am saying that? Because when it comes to the other type of structure, the sodium ions has a prismatic coordination, uh, it, it, it cannot it cannot form, usually it cannot form with a sodium content of more than 0.7 per formula unit. So the starting sodium content is lower for a prism when it comes to a prismatic coordination or a P type of structure. So P indicates that the sodium ions are in prismatic coordination. So that's a disadvantage of the P type structure. Now, but the for a prismatic coordination, the sodium ions can move from one prismatic site to the adjoining prismatic site directly. So the sodium transport is, is, is comparatively faster in this type of structure. So now, in a nutshell, to summarize, the P-type structure has an advantage of uh, sodium ions having faster transport. Uh, that is, it, it can lead to a higher rate capability. 
whereas the O3 type of structure would lead to a sluggish sodium transport and hence poor rate capability. However, the O3 type of structure has a greater sodium content to start with, up to one per formula unit. And as we know that in an alkali metal ion cell, it is the cathode material which is the reservoir for the sodium ion. Just like the cathode material is a reservoir for the lithium ion and a lithium uh, ion cell. So considering that the cathode material is a reservoir for sodium ion, it is good that the this structure can have one per formula unit of sodium ion to start with. So a disadvantage of this structure is that it has a lesser sodium ions per formula unit to start with. And that, that is a disadvantage for this structure. So one of the objectives can be how to improve, how to increase the sodium content in the P-type structure to start with. Now, both these structures have a problem related to hygroscopic nature, as I told earlier. So the, 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 so they are susceptible to moisture uptake in the sense that it all starts with sodium, with the, with the spontaneous extraction of sodium ions when left in air when left in moist air or when dipped in water, the sodium ions can come out spontaneously and get replaced by H plus or H3 plus. So that is the starting point of the moisture uh, instability. So, so that is another aspect which one has to look into to have these materials being used in a bigger way or used more in a more widespread manner in commercial sodium ion cells. So in a nutshell, again, as a summary, so these are the problems associated with the layered transition metal oxide, the layered sodium transition metal oxide. So during so desodiation, sodiation, uh, that is charge discharge, they undergo multiple phase transformations. And so that leads to a structural damage and loss in capacity, that is capacity fade. With multiple substitutions, one can uh, reduce the number of transformations and render it more stable. The second is Jan Taylor distortion if there is a Jan Taylor active ion present. The third is the transition metal dissolution if some ions which are which are which are susceptible to dissolution are present. And the fourth and very important are the air water instability. That is instability when exposed to moist air, normal humid air, which we have in a place like Mumbai, or when it is dipped in water. Uh, forget about stirring in water. So this, this air water instability leads to a lot of problem with practical handling and storage. A little bit exposure to air can lead to complete damage of the structure and render the material useless for a battery application. In addition to that, when it is air water stable and especially water, uh, uh, when it is air water unstable and especially when it is unstable when dipped in water or when stirred in water, one cannot use water to prepare the electrode sl slurry. So one has to go with the toxic and hazardous NMP to prepare electrode slurry, which is something which many countries are looking forward to get rid of. And soon NMP may not be permitted for usage in for such purposes. So one has to look for uh, cathode materials and anode materials which are stable when stirred in water. So this so this is one of the objectives of the research activities going on in our group. So in today's talk, I will talk about three aspects that is how to address the sensitivity towards air moisture. Uh, uh, while doing that, we can also address the problem related to multiple structural transformation and towards the end, how to address the low starting sodium content in the P-type structure that is elevate the sodium content and still have the P-type structure stable as the starting material. So let's talk about a simple scientific concept which probably we all know from our high school knowledge. So it's, it's, it's something very simple, just that we need to put a thought. Now, uh, if, if, we re, if we revisit the structure, if we revisit the structure of the layer transition metal oxide, we have the oxygen ion, which on the same oxygen ion is bonded to a sodium ion on one side, that is the sodium inter, the inter slab space, and transition metal on the other side, that is the transition metal layer. Now, while, that, while the sodium oxygen bond is a predominantly ionic bond, having predominantly ionic character, and we feel that not much can be done to that bond because it's an ionic bond. The interesting point is that the other side of the same oxygen ion has a transition metal oxygen bond, which is ionocovalent. And that lot can be done by varying the covalency of this transition metal oxygen bond. Now, so by by now the varying the covalency of the transition metal oxygen bond, 
one of the thing that can be done is 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 altering the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion if the bond is more covalent then the electron density will be more close to the center of the bond that is away from the oxygen ion whereas if the bond is less covalent then uh, the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion will be larger because the electrons will be more polarized towards the oxygen ion and not towards the center of the bond so which means by varying the uh, covalency of the transition metal oxygen bond one can vary the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion and now let me take back my previous statement that nothing can be done to this bond because if we can vary the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion we can alter the length and the strength of this bond the sodium oxygen bond and that is where the entire uh, entire field lies as to how to manipulate or modify the air water stability the 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 the, 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 the structural transformations during the dissociation sodiation and even change the sodium content of the p2 type structure and that is what we will see today in this talk so like the, the so uh, so as i told that if we can, if we can if we increase the covalency of this bond my oxygen ions have less effective negative charge and the sodium oxygen bond is weaker and longer but whereas if i in, if i decrease the covalency then my sodium oxygen bond can be stronger and shorter so now that can be done if we take the 3d transition metal ion period then then along the period and and little bit towards the towards both the side of the period if we select ions and such that we go with a lower charge density when i say lower charge density i mean lower charge to size ratio that suppose this is plus 4 this is plus 4 whereas the the titanium plus 4 has a larger ionic radius manganese plus 4 has a smaller ionic radius so the overall charge density of transition metal ion is smaller because the radius of the ion is larger and vice versa so having a lower charge density by having a lower charge to size ratio when i say size here i mean the ionic radius so having a lower charge to size ratio i can render this transition metal oxygen bond less covalent which means my oxygen will have a greater effective negative charge and my sodium oxygen bond can be stronger if that is the case then my spontaneous sodium extraction upon exposure to moisture will be suppressed and if if i can suppress the spontaneous sodium extraction i can improve the air water stability if can we do that we will see from the next slide onward now the effective negative charge on oxygen ion may also render the octahedral versus prismatic coordination more or less stable we can uh, we can we can tune the stability of the octahedral versus prismatic coordination and that is what we will see to the towards the later half of the talk now coming to the air water stability so we we designed model uh, layer transition metal oxide cathode material by varying the charge to size ratio as i have talked about in the previous slide so now if the charge to size ratio is lower we expect the transition metal oxygen bond uh, to be less to be to be less covalent or more ionic and so we expect that the that the the the, the interslab spacing will be lower because the sodium oxygen bond will be stronger because it is less because the transition metal oxygen bond is less, less covalent effective negative charge on oxygen ion is more so sodium oxygen bond will be stronger and hence the interslab spacing will be shorter because the sodium oxygen bond will be shorter and as the charge to size ratio is gets increased uh, systematically as as per our model compounds then the interslab spacing gets increased and that is verified by our experimental results uh, based on the materials that were prepared so and and dft calculation by my collaborator from chemical engineering iit bombay professor abhijit chatterjee they also showed that we with so as per our it goes with our hypothesis that if the charge to size ratio is lower the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion is higher and hence the sodium oxygen bond is stronger and the sodium oxygen interslab spacing is 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 is, is, is narrower so then it will be difficult for the sodium ions to come out spontaneously when exposed to moisture now if is that the so 
in this so on the left hand side i have the highest charge to size bearing um, transition metal oxide which we believe to be highly unstable when exposed to air and water and on the right hand side i have the lowest charge to size uh, bearing ratio bearing material which we believe to be air water stable and that is exactly what we see when we expose uh, the materials to air for say seven days or um, uh, say just just within a few few minutes we can see that this material starts degrading in terms of composition as well as structure whereas this material having the lowest charge to size ratio in the transition metal slab is stable even upon up to 40 days of air exposure even when soaked in water this material is absolutely stable and no change can be seen in the structure uh, which proves that this material is highly water stable not just air stable and uh, that goes as per our hypothesis now, when we looked at the water, the, the water soaked materials in TM, we can see that this material having the highest charge to size ratio in the transition of the transition metal slab and, and which and, and which has the highest covalency and then and hence the weakest sodium oxygen bond is highly susceptible to the to damage caused due to uh, upon what exposure to water. However, this material is highly stable even upon exposure to water for up to 12 hours. There is no change in structure that one can see even in with high resolution TEM. Now, when we do electrochemistry in sodium half cells, we can see the highest charge to size bearing material, which was highly unstable upon exposure to air. The, the after water soaking, the capacity is almost negligible as compared to the pristine material without water soaking, and the impedance increases drastically. By contrast, the lowest charge to size bearing uh, charge to size ratio bearing material retains its uh, capacity and the impedance hardly increases upon in, upon soaking in water which proves that not just uh, uh, in terms of the structure but also based on the electrochemical performance the the lowest charge to size bearing layer transition metal oxide is highly water stable coming to the Capacity, the, as I've shown, the capacity drops drastically for the unstable materials, as one can see here, and, and it is absolutely invariant even after water soaking for the st water stable material having the lowest charge to size ratio, and the materials having intermediate charge to size ratio uh, varies accordingly, which, which, which is, uh, so all, the details of all these are, 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 are in this paper, so for the sake of time, I cannot talk about all the materials. Now, if we look at the impedance, Yes, again, the with increasing charge to size ratio, the increment in impedance between the pristine condition and the water soaked condition keeps increasing drastically. And we can see that the charge transfer resistance actually increases drastically upon water soaking for these unstable materials, which means it is the deterioration of the structure, which is the main cause for the rise in impedance and not just formation of surface layers. So that's why with this high charge to size bearing ratio material, ratio bearing materials, it cannot be really used in a practical uh, sodium ion cell application because there will be minimal exposure to air in a practical condition. Whereas these are the materials which are right materials to be used for a commercial sodium ion cell application. Unless the environment is very well maintained throughout, right, from the uh, process synthesis step, material synthesis step towards to the cell fabrication. Now, that's all about the water soaking and the air water stability. Uh, experiments now let us look at the cyclic stability so not, these materials now have not been exposed to air water they have been kept inside the glove box uh, right after the synthesis so no air water soaking as such and but still interestingly we see that the lowest charge to size ratio bearing material which was water stable but no relevance here exhibits much better cyclic stability as compared to the highest charge to size ratio bearing material so this Charge to size ratio of the transition metal slab, not only does it influence the air and water stability, but also influences the electrochemical cyclic stability. And why is it so? So we can see that with systematic variation in the charge to size ratio, as the charge to size ratio increases, that is covalency of the transition metal oxygen bond increases, we see a decrease in the electrochemical cyclic stability. Again, proves that if one wants to use uh, that layer transition metal oxide in a real sodium ion cell, then, then, the, then the materials should have at least, uh, I mean, at most these charge to size ratios in the transition metal slab. But why does the charge to size ratio in the transition metal slab impact the cyclic stability, which have no, which has no relevance to water soaking because these materials were well protected. 
So when we did the in situ synchrotronic XRD studies, uh, we saw that the highest charge to size bearing material, the unstable one, undergoes multiple phase transformation, basically all possible phase transformations during the uh, charge discharge cycle. And no wonder that the cyclic stability is very poor. Whereas the lowest charge to size ratio bearing material undergoes just one reversible structural transformation between O3 and P3 within the same voltage window of 2 to 4 volt. Now, so it explains why this had very good structural stability or electrochemical cyclic stability and why this did not have. Now, why is it so? So even DQDB indicates that the as, as the charge to size ratio is low, lower, the structural transformation happens. The first structural transformation happens at a higher potential. So because the first structural transformation that is O3 to P3 happens at a higher potential, there is no time left for the other structural transformation to take place within the potential window uh, used. So that is why this material remains well protected in terms of the structural change during the cyc electrochemical cycling. But again, why does it? Why is it so? So when we when we estimated the ratio between the interslab spacing to the transition metal slab uh, spacing, so we found that for the onset of the O3 to P3 transition, there is a kind of fixed or critical ratio if we want to call it. So we found out a critical ratio for the onset of the O3 P3 transition during the charging or electrochemical dissociation. Now, so the materials having lower charge to size ratio, the starting, the starting uh, interslab spacing to the uh, slab thickness is much, much lower or way below this critical ratio. So a lot of sodium extraction needs to be done before this ratio can go to, can, can hit the critical ratio and lead to the onset of the o 3 pc transition. So a lot more sodium can be extracted before this transformation gets initiated and hence the subsequent transformations does not take place. If we, can, it's like if we don't go beyond too high a potential, with, uh, upper cut of potential. So that's why the, the so having the having a low charge to size ratio in the transition metal slab is not only helpful for improving the water stability, but also very helpful for improving the cyclic stability of this layer transition metal oxide. So based on this idea, one can design multiple uh, layer transition metal oxide cathode materials, which some of which can be used in a practical sodium ion cell. So since we were able to make Good materials, uh, uh, which are which are which are water stable. For one such material, we prepared aqueous processed electrodes. So we did not use any NMP based slurry for this. This is processed using water as the uh, medium and sodium alginate as the binder. And we saw that even the aqueous processed electrodes up to 750 cycles shows quite good cyclic stability, and the capacity does not seem to fade beyond about say 250 cycles. So. So aqueous process electrode is possible based on one of the materials which we developed in the group. Now, taking that forward, we are uh, presently uh, on the way to develop full cells with aqueous process uh, anode with, based on a sodium titanate, based on, again, a water-stable sodium titanate and the water-stable layer transition metal oxide-based cathode material and to lead to a prototype full cell. So we, will, we are moving towards that. Uh, it's not in here. Now, a question may arise that, yes, we are shrinking the uh, sodium in the interslab spacing. We are shrinking the interslab spacing for improving the water stability. But how does it affect the rate capability? The answer is yes, it does negatively impact the rate capability. But having said that, the moisture instability comes from a spontaneous sodium extraction. Whereas when we are doing an electrochemical cycling, there, there is greater driving force for the sodium extraction insertion. So then it does not impact the rate capability that bad, but still stops the spontaneous sodium extraction and helps with improving the moisture stability. But then we can, based on the same concept, we can, concept, we can go the other way slightly and we can tune the uh, interslab spacing to get back the rate capability without hampering the water stability to a significant extent. So for the same reason, we, we replaced a little bit of titanium 4 plus with silicon 4 plus having a greater charge to size ratio, enlarge the interslab spacing to a to a to a little to a to a to a, to a little bit to a little extent and then improve the rate capability drastically without hampering the water stability. So this material has the excellent rate capability as one can see while maintaining the water stability. Now 
moving to the last topic of today that is how to design and develop a high sodium containing p2 structured layered sodium transition metal oxide now as i as a recap let me tell that the p2 struct type structure is important because it renders sodium transport facile can lead to very high rate capability compared to the o type structure however the main bottleneck of the p type structure is the low starting sodium content per formula unit which is typically 0.7 to 0.7 per formula unit which is bad because the cathode material is supposed to be the reservoir for sodium ions in a sodium ion cell now so if we want to retain the p prismatic coordination that is have the p type structure stable while at the same time we want to increase the sodium content let us first look at the octahedral versus prismatic coordination closely what we see here is so this schematic is from a well 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 known paper by anton uh, and 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 so it it sh clearly shows that for an octahedral coordination the oxygen ions are displaced from each other i mean that the the oxygen ions are not directly sitting on top of each other in an octahedral coordination whereas in a prismatic coordination the oxygen ions are sitting directly on top of one another so if the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion is more the, they will not like to sit on top of one another rather they will prefer to be displaced with respect to one another and take up an octahedral coordination as opposed to prismatic coordination so if we can reduce the effective negative charge on the oxygen ion we can make them sit on top of one another despite having more sodium content and having them come closer to each other because of the electrostatic attraction caused by the presence of sodium ion so that is the concept uh, so it's basically again going back to the same fundamental concept for but for a different purpose so now for designing high sodium containing piece p structured layer transition metal oxide we want to enhance the covalency of the uh, transition metal oxygen bond that is the so we want to increase the charge to size ratio of the transition metal layer now when we looked at lot of literature published uh, uh, with compositions uh, pertaining to the p2 type structure and the o3 type structure we figured out that they can actually segregate it based on the charge to size ratio of the transition metal slab and we found that for the same sodium content the higher charge to size ratio uh, leads to a p2 type structure and a lower charge to size ratio leads to a o3 type structure which agrees with our hypothesis now again dft calculations by professor abhijit chatterjee's group revealed that if we de design two materials which are more or less same in terms of the composition except that manganese 4 plus in one is replaced with titanium 4 plus in the other rest all remaining the same and even the content of manganese 4 plus and titanium 4 plus remaining the same now titanium 4 plus having a uh, 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 so 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 titanium 4 plus having a lower charge to size ratio because the titanium 4 plus is bigger in size compared to manganese 4 plus will lead to lesser covalency of the transition metal oxygen bond and lead to greater effective negative charge on the oxygen ion and that leads to a O3 type structure, whereas if we have uh, manganese in place of titanium, it leads to lesser effective negative charge on the oxygen ion, and so the oxygen ions can sit one on top of each other and lead to a stability of the prismatic coordination, and we can have a P type structure. So then we, but again, there is one catch here that. Uh, while we say that if we increase the charge to size ratio in the transition metal slab we will have p type structure more stable yes that is the that is the case as also revealed by dft but then if we keep increasing the charge to size ratio charge neutrality will force us to reduce the sodium content so there has to be a balance so there has to be a balance so based on such a balance we designed one composition which is mentioned here and so when we synthesized it yes we got a phase pure p2 type structure with a fairly high sodium content of 0.84 which is fairly high compared to a sodium content of typical sodium content of 0.67 to 0.7 and the charge discharge cycling within a potential window of 2 to 4 volt at uh, c by 5 uh, indicated that we can get a, a reversible capacity uh, of around 5, 151 milliampere hour per gram which is which is better than most other 
uh, P type P type sodium transition metal oxide cathodes reported in the literature when cycled within the same potential window of 2 to 4 volt. In terms of cyclic stability, even at a high current density of 2.5 C, uh, it the capacity hardly fades for over 500 cycles in a sodium half cell. So that so so now this leads to an leads to a concept or an idea how to make high sodium containing P2 type uh, P2 type layer transition metal oxides and also it showcases one of the P type structure P2 type structure material developed in our lab which shows exceptional cyclic stability and a good sodium storage capacity and that material is also air water stable because the because due to the high sodium content the the, the interslab spacing is uh, is narrower, so the spontaneous sodium extraction is suppressed. So this material is also air and water stable. Yeah, so again, with this, as we do for some of the good results that we obtain at laboratory scale, we are progressing towards development of full cell and eventually a prototype, uh, and which should be a good development. So coming to the end of today's talk, uh, let me summarize by saying that I hope I have convinced you today that uh, by by tuning the charge to size ratio in the transition metal slab, that is by tuning the covalency of the transition metal oxygen bond, one can suppress the instability of the layered sodium transition metal oxide in significant terms towards exposure in air and moisture. That is, make it stable even upon exposure to air and water and possibly render it suitable for, for developing aqueous process cathodes. One can use the similar concept of covalency of the transition metal oxygen bond to enhance the rate capability of the layer transition metal oxide cathodes and also develop high sodium containing P2 structured layer transition metal oxide cathodes. So with this, let me thank my funding agencies and my collaborators and the uh, researchers, all the, uh, all, the, all the graduate students and the postdoctoral researchers in my group what I presented today is primarily done by, by one of my former PhD students, Bachu Savan Kumar, who is now a postdoctoral researcher at MIT USA. Uh, and, and of course, I would like to thank all the other contributors and all the students and the postdoctoral researchers in my group. And thank you to thanks to all of you for the patient hearing and for joining the uh, session today. And with this, I, am, I, I can end my talk and I can take up questions and I can leave the point by summary slide for you to have a look. Thank you very much.